Hi everybody! My apologies for having this video up as late as I did. I unfortunately had a major family emergency come up. Thankfully that emergency has mostly resolved itself. Um, so thank you for your patience and waiting for that video. Um, as a couple reminders, uh, I have given you some extensions on a couple assignments that I posted those on the front page of Canvas. Uh, so you still have your reading quiz and course activity for today, um, but you have an extension on your refutation block that's now due on August 5th to give you a little bit more wiggle room between when you turn in your argumentative essay and then the refutation block. So if you want to send me any drafts or outlines or have any questions on your refutation block, I'm happy to get in touch with you about that. Also, please remember, if you haven't done so already, please try to complete the course evaluations when you can. There's a couple reasons that it's good to do that. The first reason is that it's super helpful for me to know what went well in the course, what didn't, and your feedback is super, super helpful for future classes that I teach and I take that very seriously. The other thing is that it does allow you to see your final grades as soon as I post them. So I do not post final grades on Canvas. I post final grades on CIS. So if you go to cis.utah.edu, you'll be able to see your final grade in the course as soon as I get that uploaded. Otherwise, your final grades don't show up for a few weeks later. So I hope to have your final grades up shortly after the refutation block assignment. So hopefully by August uh, 7th or or 8th at the latest, so just know to complete your instructor evaluations in order to get that up as soon as possible. So let's get into this chapter. This is probably one of my favorite chapters because uh, logical fallacies are a lot of fun. They're arguments gone wrong is the way I like to think about it. So you can think about a logical fallacy as an argument that has some sort of hole or some sort of problem in its reasoning that means that the argument itself is not persuasive and we should really be suspicious of the argument itself. And in the year 2019, we see a lot of logical fallacies everywhere. So thinking about what makes an argument fallacious or just not persuasive or compelling because it has a flaw structurally is a really good way to think about this chapter. We know what good argumentation looks like, now we know what bad argumentation looks like from this chapter. Similarly to the refutation chapter, there's a four-step process in order to refute a logical fallacy. First, you identify what the logical fallacy is that somebody made. Second, you explain what makes that a logical fallacy. You offer your own assessment. Third, you back up and explain why that logical fallacy is a bad one. And then fourth, you explain why that undermines or refutes your opponent's argument. So as we talked about previously, it's that same four-step model, but as applied to logical fallacies, says because this argument is fallacious, this argument is just not persuasive and we shouldn't believe it. So let's talk about some of the fallacies that this chapter really gets into. So one of perhaps the most famous logical fallacies is the ad hominem, or the two quote. So the ad hominem fallacy attacks the character of the person rather than the argument that they're trying to make. So if I said to you, hey, I think we should get ice cream, and they responded by saying, no, you're stupid, right? That is attacking my character as a person rather than saying uh, why we shouldn't get ice cream. So we see this logical fallacy all the time, where it's attacking the person rather than attacking the major argument or point that they're trying to make. And that's a fallacy because, right, um, people who maybe are not very credible could make true arguments or logical arguments, or people who are very credible could make arguments that are not logical. But you're, when you're attacking the person instead of the argument, you're not really making good refutation of the argument itself. Right? So character attacks like those are often points that are not very persuasive or compelling. Another major logical fallacy is an appeal to pity. Right, So we've talked a little bit about the usage of pathos, so think about things like those really sad ads of pets that try to get you to um, adopt. Right, But if you appeal to pity, right, you're making somebody sort of feel bad for you uh, to support your argument rather than really explaining why logically you should support the argument. Remember, if you think back to Aristotle, right, Aristotle suggests that at its core, if in a perfect world, all we would have would be logos and logical arguments. So the inclusion of pathos is one that we have to have as humans because we are creatures with emotions. But if we use pity in lieu of making a logical argument in favor of a point, then we're using that type of argumentation instead. So there's also the fallacy of popularity right? Or an appeal to popularity. 
Um, an appeal to popularity is when you make an argument and say, because this thing is popular or because a lot of people believe it, it is therefore true. And I know this because when top 40 songs play on the radio and popularly those, argument, those videos and songs are good, I know they're not, right? I know that just because Justin Bieber is popular does not mean that he is a good singer. So saying that something is true because it's popular, right? A lot of people could be wrong about something, and just because it's popular does not necessarily mean that it's correct. So um, we also see that the usage of ambiguity, so things like equivocation, um, is a tactic that gets used as well, where if somebody is not clear in their argumentative structure, right, that's a fallacy too because it's not presenting an argument that makes any coherent sense. So, for example, Donald Rumsfeld, who used to work for the George W. Bush administration, uh, famously made the quote, uh, there are known knowns, that which we know. There are known unknowns, that which we know we don't know. There are unknown unknowns, that which we don't know we don't know, right? And maybe there's some sense to that argument, but when you hear it, it's very unclear and probably hard to follow. So if somebody is intentionally making an argument vague or unclear, that follows under logical fallacies as well because it's just not providing clear argumentation. Additionally, you have the appeal to authority. And the appeal to authority is a fallacy because it suggests that because the source itself is credible or has authority, that the argument underlying it is true. So while it's important to have good, credible sources, and you could say that because something comes from a credible source, it's correct, the fallacy comes in when you believe the argument is correct just because it comes from an authoritative source. So for example, right, um, you could have uh, somebody like former President Richard Nixon, who said, I am not a crook, right? And if you believed him, and just because of his authority believed he was correct, that turned out to be a fallacy because... Then Watergate happened, and it turned out that he had been lying about that particular topic. So just because somebody is credible does not necessarily mean that they're correct. So you want to think carefully about the underlying argument that gets made as well. In addition to that, um, you have uh, a sort of causal fallacy. Um, so this gets used and talked about in the chapter. Um, so this idea is that just because one thing is related to another in time and space does not necessarily mean that it causes another thing. Correlation is not causation. A really good example of this is uh, the quantity of mayonnaise consumed in the United States correlates to ski deaths. Uh, so it's probably unlikely that eating mayonnaise causes you to die while skiing. And so that shows us that just because those things are related in terms of time and space does not necessarily mean that one thing is really truly related to another. So there's other fallacies as well. There might be some fallacies that you've heard of um, that are not talked about in this chapter. For example, the slippery slope fallacy that says if we do this thing, then this thing will happen, then this thing will happen, right? So if I give you pizza, then you're going to want ice cream, then you're going to want to go to uh, a concert, then you're going to want to do this, right? So that's the slippery slope fallacy that says if we accept this thing, then we have to accept a sort of cascading set of th things there. Um, so other fa fallacies um, that you might hear is a sort of circular argument. So a circular argument is one where the sort of justification is just the same argument. So I, for example, say, um, you should believe this argument because um, I said it and I'm right and therefore you should believe it, right? That kind of becomes a very circular argument there. Um, and so those are a lot of the fallacies that get talked about in this chapter. So you should think about fallacies as just arguments that are missing or just not correct in a couple key areas. And if you use that as the basis of refutation, you can think more critically about what makes smart arguments. So that does it for this, for this week. Uh, let me know if you have any questions.